Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Steve Marks, the CMC Board of Trustees Chair and President of Hanna News Service here in, in Columbus. It's my pleasure to welcome our in-person audience today and to say hello to all of you watching via our live stream. Thank you to today's forum sponsor, EcoHouse Solar. They're sitting right here, thank you. Today's CMC live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. Thank you all. We'd, we'd also like to thank those of you who purchased a virtual seat for today's forum. We're very grateful for your continued support. You can learn more about CMC, register for events, join or renew your membership, purchase a virtual seat, or make a donation anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. Farmers have invested, uh, have invested, they have invested a lot, but they've also harvested the sun since the beginning of time. But a new crop is taking hold in Ohio, solar energy. As new alternative energy projects come to Ohio, the emerging solar energy surge has raised concerns in the legislature and spawned legislation to potentially shape its development by allowing local oversight for proposed projects. In fact, the governor signed that bill this Monday. Today, our distinguished panelists will discuss the solar business in a state not known for regular sunny skies and what the future might hold for solar energy in Ohio. I'll introduce the panelists by name and position. You can find more about each of them in your forum flyer and online. Please welcome Jason Rayfeld, Director of the Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition, the Honorable Rob McCauley, State Senator, First Ohio Senate District, Rob Slain, the County Administrator for Madison County, and our host today, Kate Barter, Executive Director of the Sustainability Institute at the Ohio State University Office of Academic Affairs. Um, let's welcome them. Be before we turn our, our program over to Kate, Jason will provide us with a brief overview, and he did say brief, overview of the solar industry. Jason, the podium is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jason Rayfeld, Executive Director of Utility Scale Solar Energy Coalition. Uh, really happy to be here today and appreciate this opportunity. Um, this is my first time doing sort of a presentation uh, to an actually live group. I've done lots of them where all your heads are in little rectangular square boxes and I'm sitting at home in front of my computer. It's much better like this, feels like we're, we're trending towards normalcy. Although if I had to be honest, uh, there are some things I don't want to go back to normal like those little stickers at the grocery store that tell you how far to stay apart. I kind of like those instead of someone's frozen foods being right up in my back when I'm trying to check out. So if we could keep the stickers, uh, I, I'd be just as happy. So when Jane asked me, uh, hey, can you uh, give us a sense of, of why solar in Ohio, what's happening, what's making this happen all of a sudden and so quickly, I thought to myself, yeah, that'd be great. Their programs are maybe an hour long, hour and 15 minutes. I think I can squeeze it all into then. And I said, yeah, Jane, I can do that. And she said, great, you have five minutes to do it. So I'm going to talk a little fast and very high level and conceptual and I'm probably going to leave some things out. And if you think I have, I probably have. So I encourage you to ask questions about anything that you don't understand. So let's get right to it because I think the clock is probably already ticking. So let's talk about geography. Uh, a lot of eastern coastal states have passed what we call renewable portfolio standards which require them to purchase a certain amount of clean energy. Many of those states can't build the clean energy. Uh, as you likely know, wind, solar, two primary clean energy sources, they take up a lot of space. Those eastern states don't have the space, they've got grid congestion, they've got population density, and as far as solar and concerns, their states are mountainous or bumpy, that's, no, that's a no-go for solar, it's gotta be flat. So they come west, and what do we find? We find Ohio, which is uh, excellent topography for solar, and I'm only here only talking about solar today. It's flat, uh, we're able to do what we call greenfield development, which is on farmland, which is already disturbed, it's already plowed, it's largely fat, it's well situated for solar. That's, those are some of the reasons. Another reason is transmission capacity. Ohio has a very, very well developed uh, transmission system that has plenty of capacity on it. In part, it's got capacity uh, because low price of gas has pushed some coal plants uh, just out of the money, and so they've shut down, opening up a lot of capacity for other types of generation, like solar, to come online. Uh, just as an additional point, a, a, an important uh, component of that transmission in regards to generation like solar is it's got to be close. Uh, if it's too far away, it's very, very expensive to build an extension 
uh, of a transmission line. It makes the whole project not, financial, not financially viable. Another reason, panels have become much more efficient. So places like Ohio, which aren't sunny year round like Utah or Nevada or New Mexico or, or some parts of California, uh, solar works now. Uh, they're much, much more efficient. They've also become much, much cheaper. In fact, according to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the cost of silicone solar cells has fallen from $76 per watt in 1977, which I think maybe the only customer then was probably NASA, uh, to 2020, it's about 20 cents per watt. So that's a massive reduction in cost, allowing this technology to become much more widely available. But what about our weather, you say? And that would be an excellent question because we have some pretty brutal winters that are pretty gray. But I would tell you that the panels, the efficiency uh, is good enough to where it still makes the electrons that we need to run these lights during those gray days. Even better is our what's called solar irradiance through the months when we have lots of sun, like right now, like July, those panels are really kicking it. They're really putting out a lot of electrons. And incidentally, that's when we need it the most. This is when we use the most. Our grid is, our grid here in the PJM region, the 13 states plus DC, is built upon days based out of July and August usually because that's our highest demand. So in short, solar shows up when we need it the most. Um, and maybe most importantly, uh, oh, I forgot. Um, these panels are manufactured here in Ohio. We've got the only U.S.-based panel manufacturer right here in Ohio, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. It's First Solar out of Perrysburg. So they're doing a great job building a lot of panels for a lot of these projects going in. Uh, but wow, maybe the biggest thing is the demand for clean energy. It is skyrocketing here in Ohio, throughout the U.S., and throughout the world. Uh, as you likely know, data centers like Amazon and Google and Facebook uh, are buying entire projects to meet their sustainability goals. You may know that GM and LG are partnering on a very advanced battery factory up at the old Lordstown plant in uh, no small part because of the, the solar farms that are going in here in Ohio. Uh, and this is part of a global trend. Recently, uh, the CEO of BlackRock, and many of, you, so many of you may be familiar with BlackRock, is a, a large investment firm that manages, I think, on the, uh, on the upwards of $7 trillion for their clients. Their CEO recently sent a letter to other CEOs around the country which said, from January through November 2020, investors in mutual funds and exchange-traded funds invested $288 billion globally in sustainable assets. This is a 96% increase over the whole of 2019. That's a massive amount of money. Additionally, they took a survey of 425 investors, of large, large, large investors around the world, tw uh, representing 27 countries, and totaling about $25 trillion of investments. And those respondents indicated that in the next five years, they intended to double their investments in clean energy. That is a lot of demand, my friends. So I'm getting close, Jane. What's it doing for Ohioans, bringing business? providing energy demand right here in Ohio. It's keeping farms in the family and allowing agricultural communities to stay as they are. I got lots more that I look forward to uh, uh, answering any of your questions. Kate, that's fast I can do it. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Jason, for that helpful background. I want to start today by thanking the CMC for inviting me to moderate this session today. I will say that I love to talk about energy. Uh, this is a fascinating and timely and very complicated topic. I'm really fortunate to work for uh, Ohio State where we have many researchers working on all kinds of issues related to meeting the increasing global needs for more energy in more sustainable ways. We're trying to teach the next generation of leaders about this topic and certainly the future of solar is one of those critically important topics. Um, I have tried to keep up with what's happening in our great state with solar energy for many years. I've been, I've been sort of in this space for probably at least 30 years, probably more than I should admit. But I've never seen the amount of utility scale projects for solar proposed, being proposed in Ohio that's been going on the past couple of years and maybe in many ways the, the past year. Uh, just to kind of level set what we mean by utility scale solar, we're talking about 50 megawatts or more of, of, of energy being provided. So we're really not talking about putting solar panels on individual homes or businesses. Although, frankly, there are some really exciting projects in Ohio t uh, going on 
uh, that might be a, a good forum for another Metropolitan Club talk. I just happened to, to see some pictures this week about J.P. Morgan Chase's big solar installation up at their Polaris Corporate Center. Very impressive project, going to provide a lot of elect meeting a lot of their electricity needs. But that's not really the topic of today's forum. And uh, you know, I just thought I would raise that, having just looked looked at that project. So yes, we are talking about utility scale. Uh, Ohio is probably the fourth or fifth largest user of electricity in the country. We need a lot of electricity to power our homes, our offices and increasingly, as we think about the future, probably our transportation sector. Now, I think as Jason mentioned, it seems to me that when we, that we could borrow the mantra used by realtors and say that when it comes to citing new utility scale solar, it's all about location, location, location. And our panelists are going to talk more about the challenges and opportunities associated with locating more solar projects in Ohio the important role of local input in that process, the long-term impact these developments might have on Ohio's land and, and Ohio's economy. Now, I'm gonna start, and let me assure you, none of this has been rehearsed, rehearsed by any of us ahead of time. We're gonna start by giving our three panelists the opportunity to just share a few opening thoughts about where they see solar fitting into Ohio's energy needs. We've already been, heard a bit of history from Jason, so I'd like to ask Senator McCauley to start this off. I, I do wanna say, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize that it's great to share the stage with another Ohio State University graduate. So thank you, Senator, for, for that. And I know you've spent a great deal of your own personal energy working on this issue this year. Um, a lot of people have told me you've become a real student of this topic, and we're certainly impressed by the, the level of effort you made to delve into this topic. Can you share some of your general thoughts about this? And then we'll have the, our other speakers just provide a couple of minutes. Sure, sure. Well, uh, thanks for having me here. I do appreciate it, and, and go Bucks. Uh, so I will say this, that solar has the opportunity um, to really change the way we think about renewable energy in some respects in the state of Ohio. Renewable energy is not new per se to the state of Ohio. We've had uh, wind energy here in the state of Ohio and large scale utility projects for probably uh, over a decade at this point. But solar, as you mentioned before, is coming in in, in a large wave right now. It has the potential, if done correctly, to be a win-win for many of the people involved. Um, not just the landowners, but also the local school districts, the local governments, and the developers, of course, and the end users. Uh, but there needs to be an awful lot of input into that process on the front end to ensure that we can reach that optimal result. Um, and that's really what we've been working on in the legislature. Thank you. Rob Slain. Um Great to meet you today. It seems like Madison County is one of those areas in Ohio that might meet those location criteria that, that uh, developers are looking for. Um, what are your general thoughts about where solar fits in to the future of your county? Well, <clears throat> thanks for having me, first and foremost. Um, from Madison County's perspective, we see solar as a, as a huge win for our community. Um, it has a significant impact on the school districts. And, then, and for those of you that are familiar with Madison County, it's mostly rural. Um, so we have some school districts out there that have uh, limited resources as far as uh, increasing revenue um, and these solar projects are just a, a windfall for them. Uh, not only that, but in the community as a whole for additional economic development, workforce development, that sort of thing. Um, but another thing that we considered uh, is the impact of uh, the solar projects on the infrastructure of the county. Um, in boosting economic development and revenue at the local government level. Typically when you have a, a, like a residential development or that sort of thing, you have to increase your police force, your sewer and water, your roads, that sort of thing. With these solar projects, uh, there's pretty limited impact uh, aside from the initial construction. After that, they're just there generating revenue for the county. So we see it as a, as a bright spot in Ohio for us. Can we just dig a little bit deeper into the issue of where all of this demand is coming from? And 
you know, I know because none of you are really the users of the energy. Um, you're all representing different aspects of this. But maybe start with, and maybe this is a, uh, a, a you know, what, who's behind, where, where is this energy going to go from these large solar projects? Jason, maybe you want to start with that. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, thanks, Kate. So this demand started really uh, with, with corporate demand, with corporations deciding they were going to institute sustainability goals or ESG goals uh, as, as, they, as they call them. There's a great organization called the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance or REBA. And uh, if I had thought uh, further ahead than this morning, I would have had this giant printout. These are sort of their, their, their uh, leadership of REBA. And I, I promise you, you would recognize nearly every one of the uh, uh, logos on that sheet that simply have decided uh, we're, we want to be good corporate citizens. Uh, it's important. Uh, it's important to us uh, that we manage our impact on the environment and uh, do as much as we can for climate change, clean air, uh, what have you. So I think that's where it really started. Uh, you've got, you know, you, it, it's sort of it bled over into uh, cities. You know, Columbus and Cincinnati, right here in Ohio, are driving that demand further by uh, enacting their own their own sustainability goals. Uh, Rob Slane, do you want to touch on that? Sure, I can add to that. Um, with Madison County, we, we're really on uh, kind of the precipice of development. Uh, we see a lot of economic development in our future. And along with that economic development, we have companies such as Amazon that is asking for green energy, renewable energy. So um, we feel that's a feather in our hat to be able to go to those companies and say we have three existing or soon to be existing projects and two more in the works. So without, um, when, when you, so the companies are, are uh, pursuing this as to meet their own goals, but anyone want to take it one step further and say, what's behind the corporate interests? Is it investors? Is it consumers? Is it climate change? You know, any, anyone want to comment on, on taking that just one step a little bit deeper into the demand side? If, if I had sure, to say, I'd say it's probably all three. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's something that these these companies are in business to make money. They're in business to serve customers, um, and they're in business to serve their shareholders. And so, uh, for a variety of reasons, I think they are. We are seeing a, a growing trend of companies that want to um, be more be more green. Um, and so, I, I would I would say that that is something that. Um, is going to continue as a trend, um, which I think is um, even more reason for us to be mindful of uh, how all of this interplays together as far as the siting of these projects and things like that. Thank you. So maybe I could, maybe we could talk a little bit about, Jason, in your opening comments, you talked about uh, that places on the East Coast not being as suitable for solar as Ohio based on just our, the geographic topog and the topography of, of the state. But can you provide this audience with a little more clarity on how much land do we need for a large solar project and how much of Ohio is, from, from your members, really suitable for this kind of development? So that's a great question, Kate. Um, as far as how much land is needed, it really depends on the project itself. Um, if you, you know, rule of thumb with development depending on the project is you're looking at probably five to seven acres per megawatt. And you know, that's going to depend on things like setbacks, whether there are wetlands, whether there are lands within the project footprint that you do not put panels on. Uh, but you protect for whatever reason. So if you take, uh, I, I'm a lawyer, not a scientist, so I like the, the round numbers. If you take a 100 megawatt project, which is probably representative uh, of some of what they are, you're going to look at 500 to 700 acres uh, for a project of that size. Uh, the estimates that I have seen are that there are uh, upwards of 10 million tillable acres in the state of Ohio. And so even if you talk about all of the even potential projects that are out there being built, uh, whether they be in the, I think it's 38 or 39 projects in the Ohio Power Siting Board process right now, and what's in the PJMQ, which is where sort of out there projects got to sort of sign up and get, get approval to be built. Um, even if all of those would be built, and they won't be, that's a speculative uh, development as a, as a specul speculative discipline. And 
maybe you're, I'm looking at one of my members here, uh, one of my board members here, probably on the, na in the name of uh, I don't know, 15 to 25 percent actually get built. So, um, if you know, uh, so even if everything gets built, uh, you're, you're looking at an exceptionally small. Our numbers tell us about one percent of that farmland is covered um, by solar panels. So I want to switch to uh, Senator McCauley. You, you really, uh, your legislation that the governor just signed, it really was focused on local input. Can you talk a little bit more about what made you want to tackle this issue? What were you hearing from your constituents or others that led to the introduction of this bill? Absolutely. As I mentioned in, in my introduction, uh, renewable energy is, is, is relatively new, but it's not as new to some parts of the state as it is to others. So my district is the very northwest corner of the state. We've had a great deal of renewable energy relative to the rest of the state in my district. Um, and we've seen in many ways how the power siting board process up until recently has worked in that you could have projects that were coming in that were seeking to transform thousands of acres potentially, in some cases tens of thousands of acres in the case of a wind project. Um, and you would have no meaningful local input that was considered at the Ohio Power Siting Board. There were cases where you had unanimous opposition uh, from county commissioners, township trustees, and others um, that would be heard by the Power Siting Board, but it wouldn't necessarily enter into the decision on whether or not to grant the certificate um, until very recently um, in the Republic Wind case up in Seneca County. And so I, I, when we're thinking about this, and, and I would agree with Jason that um, it, there are a lot of tillable acres, but when we're thinking about solar, it's not just saying, hey, we shouldn't worry about taking farm, grand out, farm ground out of commission. It's what farm ground? It's, and this is where even my district is hearing about this in the terms of solar. Where are you going to site this? What are we giving up by the siting being where it is? Um, is it being sited at the edge of a village or a city um, in areas that have been kind of earmarked or planned for and infrastructure has been extended to for the potential development of industrial or residential developments? Um, and those are the types of things that if we have more local involvement as a requirement up front, those are the types of things that can be dealt with and those are the issues that can be mitigated, not just for the locals, but also for the developers. So can I, can I maybe ask Rob Slane as representing local officials in Madison County, how, 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 do, how do you all feel about this kind of authority in, in House Bill, or I'm sorry, Senate Bill 52, um, that, that decision making coming down for, for local officials the way this bill has, has fashioned? Yeah, I think uh, we appreciate it. Um, prior to the uh, introduction of that bill, uh, basically the only authority that the county commissioners had uh, was the passage of an alternate energy zone. Um, and that had a little bit of flexibility there, but ultimately it went to the Ohio Power Siting Board. So, you, so your, the local officials in Madison County are comfortable with being more on the seat to respond to concerns or support for, for these projects? Yeah, I think that's safe to say. So, and it's interesting in that the Farm Bureau, I think, is one of, you know, as we think about farmland, maintained an opposition position to this bill throughout the process, as I understand it. I'm just an observer, not a participant in any of this. But what, what was, where, how does this play out for the farmers who are really the places where we're going to, to build these projects? If, if I could respond to that, I, I think when you survey the membership of the Farm Bureau, depending on where they are in the state, you're gonna get very different results from their membership. And I think even Farm Bureau would admit that their, their on the ground, their grassroots membership is very divided on this issue because they've seen in some parts of the state how it's impacted uh, their farmland or their home values even relative to other parts of the state. And so um, I think Farm Bureau, generally speaking, uh, looks at, looked at this and wanted to be consistent across the board. Um, that they prefer the statewide decision-making process as it concerns many of these capital investments. Um, and so, uh, but I would say, in talking with my local farm bureaus, I would say many of those members and those organizations lean more on the side of what we did in 52 as opposed to the statewide organization. And if I could just briefly add to that, at the local level, what we've seen is um, uh, 
a lot of people have concerns about taking uh, valuable farm ground out of production. Um, and typically we reply with, well, programs have been around since the 70s uh, taking farm ground out of production. You've got crop programs, CRP, set-asides, that sort of thing. So taking farmland out of production isn't necessarily something new. And in addition to that, we feel that um, the, the solar, the utility scale solar projects uh, will not require the maintenance uh, that farm ground typically does. And I'm referring to herbicides and pesticides and uh, that sort of thing, uh, soil erosion. Um, so we feel 20 years, 25, 30 years when these uh, solar fields are uh, taken down, the ground could potentially be in better shape than what it was uh, before the project began. Jason, you want yeah, to comment on that? I, I would like to actually, to the to the concern uh, about the impact of sort of taking agricultural land out of traditional agricultural use. Uh, I would suggest that this is another agricultural use, uh, although not traditional. But to that end, uh, for the second time, uh, my group has commissioned a study uh, between Ohio University and the Ohio State University to look precisely at that. It's just gotten off the ground here in this last month uh, where they're starting to put some scientific instruments in the field at some of these locations to see w is there an impact, what's the impact going to be. Now there was some sort of sensational stuff initially about, oh, we're going to have food shortages, food shortages, and we're not going to have food shortages. Uh, you know, our, our U.S. government pays some farmers not to farm. There's not going to be any food shortages. But we are interested in what's that mean? What's that mean for the community when you change from corn or beans to uh, a solar array. So we, we are looking into that. I don't have results right now. If I had to guess, maybe November we see that. Um, I'd also suggest that, that uh, you know, I agree with, with, with a lot of what uh, 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 our panelists here have said. Uh, many of these farm families, however, that, that are supportive look at this as a way to say, well, I can, I can really bust my butt um, and hope that the commodity prices stay there for $150, $200 an acre for, for corn or beans. Uh, and then a solar developer comes along and says, hey, we'll give you five, six, seven times that per year. What do you want to do? Oh, and by the way, you don't have to do anything for that 30 or 40 years except collect a check. So the farmer, who may be 50, 60, 70, starting to think about well, how am I gonna, what am I going to do with this, this farmland that's been in our family for four generations, suddenly has a connection that they can do something with, that they can, they can hand it down uh, to, to their to further generations. So finally, I would also say that there's lots of reasons that, that farmers oppose um, um, using land for solar. It's not just it, it's, it's taking fertile ground, but there's many times where locally, um, you know, the only way a farmer can expand is if they get more land, right? And so if that's taken up uh, by solar, they, they can't really expand. So that's... So I'm going to switch uh, subject or top question, the line of question a little bit into sort of this this role of local government that was created in House Bill, in Senate Bill 52. You know there there have been some questions about we we had you know 10 years ago we saw this huge upswing in development of Eastern Ohio for natural gas development in in Appalachian counties. Uh, why are help? Help the audience understand why you see, maybe start with Senator uh, McCulley, why the rules of the game for citing energy should be different based on the energy source. Well, I, I would say there's an apples and oranges comparison there. One is power generation um, that has much more flexibility as to where it gets cited. Um, and others is mineral extraction. It's not necessarily power generation, and it's, it's only going to be able to extract it in the areas where it's at, those minerals are actually present. And so while solar and wind may be more suitable in some parts of the state than others, um, those parts of the states offer much more flexibility, um, in my opinion, than would the extraction of, of minerals. Um, you also have to look at the idea of necessity. And, and what the overall uh, benefit would be. So when we're looking at uh, wind and solar development, even right now, uh, adding to the grid, our grid, PJM, is at about 135% of capacity. That's without any additional generation being added to it. And so adding these solar projects, uh, or even wind projects, or any other projects for that matter, even baseload power, 
isn't necessarily adding a needed amount of capacity to the PJM. Um, in fact, the PJM, uh, they'll even tell you they're, they're very uh, satisfied with the condition of their grid and the amount of capacity that they're generating on their grid. And so I do think there is a difference um, that warrants a, a difference in treatment. Um, however, this is the Ohio General Assembly, and I anticipate somebody maybe will introduce a bill like that. But we wanted to focus in Senate Bill 52 on power generation um, that is transformative in its land use uh, uh, in the form of these renewable energy projects. Jason or Rob, do you have any comment on that topic? I do. I think that um, we're fortunate in this, in this state to have the choice of all of the above. And if you had to ask me what I think our energy strategy should, should be, it would be just that, all of the above. All of the ways we're able to produce electrons here in Ohio, I think we should. Now, much of that is market dependent, right? If you're too expensive, uh, that's not really going to work. People aren't going to buy it. Uh, we are a competitive, we're fortunate to be a competitive deregulated market here in Ohio. Um, I actually believe that, uh, for example, gas and solar, which are the two most likely to be built right now, they're not really competitors. They're, they're more likely complementers uh, in the way that they work. Um, you know, and, and Senator McCulley spoke to uh, PJM and being uh, happy w with their grid. Um, you know, there was a point in time where we were happy with all coal, and that's no longer the case. You know, the, the shift in demand is in part because people want a cleaner form of energy. Uh, we tried with the scrubbers and the cleaners, and people moved on, and then there was gas, which is cleaner still, but still has emissions. And lately, uh, in the case of solar, it's come on, and people said, hey, solar is viable, it works, uh, and it's, it's cleaner yet. In fact, there's no emissions, so let's move to that. So. You know, we, we could fill up our whole grid with coal, but just customers have moved on. It's not what they want anymore. Rob Slain, any thoughts on from the local level about energy, different sources of energy having different requirements locally? How does that how does that play out for local officials? Um, you know, I don't have a whole lot to add. Uh, it's uh, it's difficult for me just over in Madison County. Uh, we don't really have experience with the eastern side of the state, but in the three or four years that we've been working in this area, I think what we've seen is that solar is actually becoming competitive with the, uh, with the gas-fired uh, power plants and, and probably out-competing coal-fired plants. So as we, um, could I ask if anyone's willing to tackle the question of, as we think about Ohio's electricity needs, and as I said, we need a lot of electricity in this state. What, what is your best guesstimate as to how much of our grid could be, could be just, you know, we, 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 natural gas I think is number one, coal is number two, nuclear is number three. Right now renewable energy is really a very small percentage of the overall electricity being generated in the state. But what could, what could Ohio look for in the future in terms of how much of our electricity needs could be met by solar? Maybe it was a tough question to ask. Jason, I'm gonna look at you though. You're representing the industry. What are, you, what are your thoughts? So um, I'm, I'm thinking of the number of projects that are, uh, as I mentioned previously, at, at the Ohio Power Siding Board, and I think that number is 38 currently, and that means in pre-application all the way to actually constructed. I think that's how many are there right now. There are a number uh, that are preceding that that are in the PJM queue that I mentioned uh, that's a lot of solar for Ohio, especially in a short amount of time. Uh, if I didn't say it before, I'll say it now. I understand people's concerns going, whoa, wait, what's happening? What's all this change? I think that's healthy. I think that's reasonable. I think people, particularly in small communities, should say, what's this big change? What's this going to mean for me? And I, I encourage people to ask questions about it. I uh, was speaking to a reporter just a couple of weeks ago, and his final question on the phone to me was, well, what should I tell people that have questions or maybe don't support uh, uh, this project? And I said, call the developer. Call the developer and put the hard questions to them, and if they can't answer them, I said, then maybe you should have concerns, uh, but reach out to them. So as far as how, how much or, or what can we do with it, you know, there's, 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 there's plenty of demand and use for solar, uh, for all of it uh, to come on. Um, we, we're not in danger of, of, of overbuilding or building too much. It's a competitive market. Um, it's going to be bought. Well, and I guess I was trying to make the point that even if all those projects are built, there were probably still under 10% of the load, I would guess. Solar right now is probably maybe five-tenths of 1% yeah. of the energy output in the state of Ohio. So 
poised to become much larger, but I mean, we are in the infancy right now. It's right. small. So I think, so I am going, I could keep asking lots and lots of questions, but we're gonna move to our in-person because we want you all to have some chance to ask questions. Uh, can I take just one second and ask one final question? And this has gotta be a rapid answer. So what's the next big energy issue to be debated in the state of Ohio? Anyone wanna venture? Senator McCauley, what do you think it is? Well, uh, I, I would say that the, the uh, landscape at the Ohio General Assembly is constantly transforming as we've seen particularly in the energy uh, space. And uh, uh, for those who are wondering, I, I'm glad we're repealing House Bill 6, not that it's related to this discussion, but uh, the energy space has been one that's been uh, constantly changing. And, and so I think it's just a matter of, um, from a policy standpoint, to what extent does the legislature want to get together and, and figure out what should that next step be? Um, and uh, how, do, how do we, I think everybody's in favor of freer markets, and so how do we uh, foster something like that would be my broad answer to it. Um, Jason, quick answer from your standpoint. Uh, we got some, uh, we got batteries coming on and how are we gonna figure, how, how do those figure into our grid and how do those help? I think that's gonna be an issue. And. Rob, I can ask you, but if you want to take a pass, we, we, I'll pass. okay. So I know Jane is, uh, Jane Scott's monitoring some, if there, do we have any questions from the live stream that you want to post? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, some I think you've already addressed, so I'll try to consolidate. And um, please, anybody line up behind me, we'll switch off with questions I have on the, on, on the live stream as well as in, aud in audience questions. So um, they're complicated questions. Um, Russell Marzette from Ohio State, these discussions focus on panels deployed directly to the land, which is a valuable natural resource. How do building integrated PV options compared to solar farms is the merit in a balanced approach? I don't even know if I understand the question. I think he's looking at building panels on top of big factories and things like that and not on the land. Yeah, Jane, I can, I can speak to that briefly. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, if you're talking about a utility scale installation, which is what, what my group does, they're typically far too large to be put on top of a building. Uh, it's more expensive to put it on top of a building. Uh, many buildings are not near transmission lines, so it lacks many of the characteristics needed for a utility scale development. That doesn't mean that, uh, I think I read recently, companies like Walmart couldn't put panels on all of their retail locations, which is that's a lot of panels. It would re represent a lot of power. Um, and still get uh, a lot of benefit. And frankly, a lot of companies are doing they that. Are. That's why I mentioned at the beginning, this is probably a whole other topic. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got a large commercial installation up at Polaris done by J.P. Morgan Chase. What's motivating these, what are the, what are the trade-offs, how, how are those working, is, is, is a whole other topic for the CMC to delve into. <laughs> Always plenty of topics. Uh, Ron Kenrich, uh, this is about windmills, but can one still farm under windmills? And do taxes change if a farm is all solar? And I'll add to that, I've seen a couple articles about um, prairies and grazing under solar. So maybe what the question is, is the land completely out of use or is something happening with both wind and solar that would still be compatible with other crops? So I'll, I'll give that a shot at the beginning too. I don't. I, I certainly don't speak for wind, but I, I would be surprised if there was farming sort of right up under the turbines, uh, because from time to time it's going to need maintenance. I could absolutely be wrong. Um, as far as the utility, the, the solar installations, there's uh, many of my members are putting sheep or pollinator habitat or native species there uh, to allow them to grow. There's no farming underneath it. There's just probably not enough room for the farm equipment. Solar panels you're talking about, probably a maximum height of 14 feet, uh, usually in the 10 to 12 foot range. That's why Senator McCauley and, and uh, I mentioned earlier, you can, you can largely hide them with, with a view shed, uh, you know, native species plants, uh, good setbacks, and they're very, very difficult to see as compared to, to some other things. If, if I could, uh, usually with wind turbines, there is a set aside at the base of the turbine that's maybe about an acre, acre and a half, something like that, um, where there is no farming, but you can farm right up to that acre or acre and a half. 
um, to the point that Jason just made, that's kind of a distinction between the two, um, is that normally you'll see these solar, uh, solar arrays and developments that have fences around them. Um, and so um, it's largely area that's being unused underneath those panels. Okay. And I can uh, address the, the, the tax question there. Um, and as far as solar is concerned, um, that property does come out of the uh, CAUV for your local taxes. And so you might want to say what the CUV is. Uh, cal calculated agricultural use value. So essentially, uh, you know, a piece of property that may bring $68,000, $100,000 in, in CAUV could then, that could double or triple in, of, for the tax base. Okay, great. Um, Sarah Knutson, you've already answered part of this, but the second part, does the bill being discussed include local oversight of fracking? What about the right of the private landowner to decide best use for their land? So it, as we discussed earlier, it doesn't address fracking. That's an entirely different topic in my mind. But as far as best use is concerned, um, you know, having local control over these large land use decisions is not a foreign concept. Uh, Jason mentioned earlier that many of these projects will be 500 to sometimes even 1,000 acres. To put that into a frame of reference, 640 acres is a square mile. And so uh, many of them are going to be over a square mile, and they're not necessarily all contiguous to each other. And so it's going to be affecting many parcels as far as the neighboring parcels and things of that nature. And so um, I always bring up the example that if you owned uh, 640 acres or square mile at the edge of town and General Motors came to you or Amazon or whoever else and said, hey, we want to build a facility on your land, you wouldn't just be able to hand them over the keys, so to speak, and say, okay, go ahead, start turning shovels. You would need to go through an awful lot of local approval to do that. You would need to go through zoning authority. You'd need to go through the planning commission. You'd need to go through an awful lot to be able to get to that point. Um, although this is not that, per se, it is still transforming the land use from what it is currently and uh, traditionally been used for into something that it has not been currently and traditionally used for. And therefore, um, it's not uncommon for there to be local involvement over that sort of thing. Chuck Lind asks, do the panelists believe that market demand shifts towards renewable energy will meet the recommendations of climate scientists? That's a tough, big question. I'll, I'll go first with that one. Um, you know, energy production, climate change, a hotly debated topic amongst the scientific community, hotly debated amongst the political community. It's hotly debated pretty much everywhere. Uh, but. I think universally agreed on is to impact this planet's uh, changing climate is going to take a monumentally massive effort and changing our generation mix is one piece of that. Um, you know, it, it, this won't do all of it. It's, it's so complicated. Uh, so to that gentleman's question about can it meet the uh, scientist's prediction, I, I, I'm not sure it can do that. but. You know, the solar that we hope to build here in Ohio is, is not going to be the panacea to, you know, to start the climate getting colder again. So Trip Lazarus is asking, how do we use as a society, how do we as a society strike a good land use balance between solar and farming? And I would add industrial and, um, what do we call it, sprawl, making sure we have enough energy and food. take a shot at that. Um, in Madison County at the local level, uh, we have a comprehensive land use plan that we review every four or five years, uh, make changes uh, as needed. We've also completed corridor studies, looked at areas of uh, economic development, future economic development, those sort of things. Um, so we will likely um, be adding some sort of land designation to our comp plan uh, to essentially accomplish that goal of a, of a good balance between ag and renewable energies, um, solar in this case. Um, 
Also, we appreciate the uh, the bill that was introduced that allows the uh, county commissioners to have a little bit more control over the situation. And then I think as, as Jason commented, or the senator commented, we don't want to see uh, solar fields right next to the city of London. I mean, that's just something that doesn't make sense. So we appreciate that, uh, that ability to kind of direct uh, things in, in what we feel would be the right direction. Gather from the commissioner's points is this is the entire reason we need these planning tools in place. Um, this is the entire reason we need to have this required local involvement up front is because these local elected officials in many cases are the ones who are best equipped to, to try and make these decisions rather than a board that, that's dealing with technical nature and things of that nature. Um, and the power siding board down in Columbus who um, are all appointees as opposed to elected officials from that local jurisdiction. Yeah, just, just real, real briefly, uh, follow up on that. I agree with everything, uh, you know, and in large part, we're very supportive of local controls. A couple things that make us nervous about it. One is the misinformation that gets out there and gets to local officials before the project developer has a chance to even address the commissioners or the trustees and say, let us tell you about our project. Um, I think that a cooperative effort amongst the developer or developers and local officials and the Ohio Power Siding Board is really the best way to come out with good development. I don't want bad development. My members don't want bad development because it hurts the industry. It makes our jobs much more difficult. Let me, let me add to that real quick. Um, I'd be remiss in, in not bringing it to everyone's attention that the three projects that we have going on in Madison County right now, and of course we got two or three more, um, each of the first three companies, they came to the board meetings, they said the next best answer to yes is no, and you know, if it's gonna have opposition here, we don't wanna put our resources here. Uh, those three companies, they kept us in the loop. Uh, we had our public meetings, our public hearings, um, and really they were um, easy to work with. So it wasn't necessarily a, a big surprise at any point in time for us. Hi, my name is Joe Campbell. I'm with Ohio State, and thank you for the, the panel this afternoon. Um, my question actually builds on this exact conversation. I'm wondering if you, if you look at other states or other counties or townships, where have, been, where have been some successful examples of this creative local control element where developers have worked closely with uh, local governments to come up with solutions that really work? Is there anything that you've looked to outside of Madison County or Ohio? I, I, would, I would say that, um, if I could, um, is that each state handles this very differently. Um, you go to Indiana, and much of the decisions in Indiana are completely local, without much involvement from the state at all. Uh, you go to Michigan, there's required local involvement up in Michigan. In many of the states surrounding us, that is actually the case. Ohio was kind of unique um, in the Midwest as far as states that had a completely state-run uh, system, which um, when it was set up uh, in 2008, when the, when the law changed to exempt these projects from local involvement or, or being subject to local rules or regulations, um, the thought was, well, we're going to do this for the proliferation of wind and solar development, primarily wind at that time in the state of Ohio. Um, what we've seen is what ended up uh, in the legislature now revisiting that policy um, where there were some, some issues where you didn't get that, that buy-in from the locals that's really necessary to generate the type of project that, um, that, that it seems like they're having potentially in Madison County, um, where you have uh, people on all sides of the argument who are, who are getting something good from the project. And so um, this is just really uh, trying to make it a more collaborative process that we think will result in many more projects being uh, on the positive end by all involved rather than um, somebody having to be a loser. Thank you for your very good question. One of the, in my opinion, one of the challenges that we have is this is all brand new. So, you know, up until very recently, I couldn't say, okay, let's get everybody on this bus. I'm going to take you out and show you what one of these solar farms looks like because they weren't there. And so you couldn't sort of see it, touch it, taste it. What, what's the impact? What does this thing actually look like? And that adds to the apprehension factor, if you will, is, well, I understand you're telling me this and you're showing me these visuals and you're saying it's going to be okay, but... You know, I've been down that road before and I don't feel good about it. 
one of the things I believe, I hope will happen is as more are built and you can say, hey, come look at this, come look at this and you see if it's right for your community. You see if this developer did a proper view shed and a proper setback and maintained uh, drain tiles and all the things. I think that's gonna be very, very helpful. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm not for bad development or bad community engagement at all because it really makes it difficult for the good developers, one of those who's, who's sitting right here. We have time for just one or two quick more questions, sir. Okay, thank you. And again, thanks to the panel. Thanks for Jane for putting this panel on. <clears throat> so my name is Doug Miller. I work with Ohio's Electric Cooperatives. Uh, full disclosure, I am in the utility industry, so I want to kind of pose a question about um, kind of this national debate on climate change and these net zero carbon goals and things like that. And first of all, Jason, I want to just acknowledge. And thank you for kind of acknowledging that this all of the above strategy for Ohio is really important. Um, you mentioned that solar is kind of like a fraction of this. Um, and so Ohio's electric cooperatives, we have, we are largely coal. We have natural gas peaking plants and we have about 10% of our portfolio is renewable through like landfill gas, solar, things like that. Uh, so I appreciate that. The other comment before I ask the question <clears throat> is that you, I think somebody mentioned that electric utility companies kind of like coal. <laughs> um, the fact is that the reason why we have coal uh, was there's something called the Fuel Use Act back in the 1970s uh, where we were not allowed to install natural gas, we were only allowed to install coal. So here we sit today with a lot of stranded investments with coal. And so, you know, we need time to kind of pay down that debt and to kind of make this transition. But this federal debate on climate change and these net zero carbon goals in less than 15 years, 14 years of to be a net zero carbon economy. Uh, and just kind of your perspectives on that as compared to your comments with the all of the above strategy, the fact that we do need coal, we do need natural gas, we do need renewables, things like that. So if you could come on and comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, great question. I have to be careful or you're gonna cost me my job. Um, so some of these goals seem uh, exceptionally aggressive to me. And um, I understand the impetus behind them, the concern uh, about air quality, the concern about impact on crop yield uh, from, from pollution, the concern about our environment. Uh, that's real, uh, that, that's, that's absolutely real. But what's also real is our things like you mentioned, is there's people's lives and communities uh, and businesses and investments are tied up in these. And so it doesn't really work in a real sense to just shut them down tomorrow. Um, that's, that's not a really very, very realistic goal. So if you're gonna talk about moving to a, a you know, 100% clean economy, you're gonna have to find a way to bring that into a landing. And, and I mean a, a safe landing, not a crash landing where you just cut it off. So I don't know if that sort of answers your question or, or responses to it, but that's sort of where I am on it. I, I think we are probably out of time. I will say, you know, these are, boy, Jane, the, the number of CMC topics, uh, forum, future forums based on some of these questions, um, I, I can see them in the future. And, you know, we, we I restraining myself from asking some of these additional questions or comments, especially about how this fits into global climate change and what all that could mean for, for farmers in, in Ohio. But at this point, um, despite my desire to dig into some of these issues a little more deeply, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve for some concluding remarks today. Thank you. <clears throat> I hope you found today's uh, forum um, informative, electrifying even. Um, it, it is a, it's an important topic and, and I'm glad to have the people here. So please make plans to join us next Wednesday evening. There is no forum next Wednesday during lunch at CMC as we present Rapid Five, The Power of Parks and Waterways, Local Planners Unveil Their Designs to Connect. So um, I want to give some thanks out to our forum sponsor, EcoHouse Solar, um, and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC, and thank you to our online virtual seat patrons. And our special appreciation, uh, appreciation and thanks to our speakers, Jason Rayfeld, uh, the Honorable Rob McCauley, Rob Slane, and our host, Kate Barter. Um, thank you all for joining us.
We could do not, we could not do this uh, without all of you. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday evening, once again, um, as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Thank you. Great job.